Hello and welcome to GameSack. Back in the 8 and especially the 16-bit days, it was always interesting to see what sacrifices had to be made in order to port an arcade game to a home console. Now, it wasn't just the less powerful hardware that was available at home that caused these compromises, but also the limited amount of cartridge space available as well. I still find these differences interesting today, especially when there's multiple ports of the same game. So, let's start out with a game that was ported to many different platforms. First up is Samurai Showdown, because why not? This mid-1993 weapons-based arcade game uses Neo Geo hardware. You choose from a variety of different fighters and slash each other to death. Some of the characters, like Earthquake here, are pretty large. I only mention this because it will become important when I talk about the ports. The screen also zoomed in and out as the fighters got closer or further away from each other. It really is a super fun game with great ambiance, and it was a refreshing take on the one-on-one -on -one fighting game genre at the time. Of course, the home port to the Neo Geo AES console is mostly identical. I mean, that was the point of the entire platform. However, they changed the red blood to white sweat, something that would plague Neo Geo home games from here on out. Now, you would think that people who could afford $250 video games could handle a little bit of blood in them, but apparently SNK didn't think so. They really had no clue about their own demographic. A port of Samurai Showdown from Takara arrived on the Genesis in late 1994. This one was developed by Saurus, the makers of Shock Troopers. As you can imagine, it was trimmed down from the arcade quite a bit since the arcade was 202 megs and this is only 24 megs, but it still manages to be quite playable. I like the six button controls in this one and for me it makes the moves easier to pull off compared to the Neo Geo joystick. Unfortunately, the game feels slower, but it's not bad enough to be unplayable. There are a few attacks that are missing or changed here compared to the arcade version. They also omitted the character Earthquake and his stage because I guess he's just too big of a sprite. Also gone, of course, is the zooming in and out of the playfield as you play. This version seems to be locked into the closer view. The game is also letterboxed, which is honestly unusual for the Genesis, but here we are. The introduction graphics are gone and we only get the text and some falling leaves. Interestingly, this game has the red blood, which the Mighty Neo Geo home version did not. Weirdly, I noticed some corrupted graphics about a third of the way down the screen, usually manifesting itself as a few dots. This strangeness comes and goes. As far as the sound is concerned, it's okay. It certainly could have been better, even on the Genesis here. Most of the voices during the fights are here, and they sound fine. Most of the announcer voice is gone though, as is the voice in the intro. The music is the main thing I feel could have been better. Overall, this isn't a horrible game, but I feel they didn't quite give it their all. Samurai Showdown came to the Sega CD in early 1995 from Norwegian developer Funcom. You'd think that this would just be the cartridge version with better music, but no. It's actually better in most ways. For one, this has all of the attacks in it and the game plays at the proper speed. The control itself behaves the same way as it does in the Genesis version. It's also not letterboxed like the Genesis version is, though if you think the graphics are better or not, well, that's a matter of taste. The referee is completely gone in this one though. The victory scenes have been restored, but it needs to load first so you can shut them off if that becomes annoying. This one doesn't zoom in or out either, despite the Sega CD having scaling capabilities. I wonder how well that would have performed. The red blood is still in here as well. Even the full intro made it into this version. Sadly, Earthquake and his stage are still gone. The music is the same as the Neo Geo game since it's just streamed off of the CD. Unfortunately, the voices are much, much worse than the Genesis game. They sound rough, scratchy, and low bitrate. <laughs> Overall, I like this one a lot more than the Genesis version, but man, those voices really do bring it down. Samurai Showdown came to the Super NES in late 1994, developed by Monolith. This version is 32 megs, eight more than the Genesis. It has the full intro, but no voiceover. As far as the gameplay goes, it plays well enough and it doesn't feel too slow. 
The control setup requires you to hold one of the shoulder buttons while pressing down a different button for a strong attack. This actually works better than you might think. The game screen is locked in the zoomed out mode, so the characters are quite small compared to the other versions. It's also letterboxed just like the Genesis version. The red blood is here, and I'm kind of blown away by that. I do feel that the graphics in the Sega CD version are better though. Oh, all of the characters are here, even Earthquake. The victory screens are also intact. The music is decent enough, and I can't really complain about it. There are more voices here than either Sega version, however, most of them are absolutely drenched in reverb. This game is supposedly in Dolby Surround for some reason, but the only thing that really comes out of the back speakers is the reverb. Overall, not a horrible port, all things considered. In 1995, Samurai Showdown showed up on the 3DO from Crystal Dynamics. This was the closest thing you could get to the Neo Geo version at the time. The graphics and music are incredibly faithful. All of the characters and their moves are here, the blood is here, and even the screen zooming makes it in. What's interesting to me is that this is the only version that uses transparent shadows of the characters on the ground instead of just flickering them back and forth. I much prefer this. The control is actually not that bad. The 3DO controller only has three buttons, so in order to kick, you need to hold down the right shoulder button as a modifier. Unfortunately, there are two glaring issues with this version. First and foremost is the frame rate. It can get extremely choppy, especially when earthquakes on the screen. It's so bad that sometimes it's hard to tell even what's going on. At no point is the 3DO version as smooth as the Neo Geo original, and that's too bad. Next, the voices and sampled sounds are not well done. They're all here, but they had to limit the data size of the sounds to fit them into the console's RAM, so the quality has been greatly sacrificed. It still sounds better than the Sega CD voices, but not tremendously much. Still though, I'm surprised that everything is running this well on the 3DO of all things. Samurai Spirits arrived on the FM Town's computer in Japan in September of 1995 and it was developed by Japan Home Video. This one requires a fairly beefy FM Town's unit to run at full speed and even then it's far from perfect. It even has this screen zooming, but this can be turned off which might be a good idea if you have a slower FM Town's machine. It also offers a choice between two and six button control. The music is streamed off of the CD, so like the 3DO, it sounds like the arcade. Special thanks to Retrocore for capturing this video for me using a real FM Towns machine as I don't have access to one of them. Maybe someday. <laughs> Samurai Showdown came to the Game Gear in late 1994 and it was developed by Takara. There are quite a few characters missing from this one, but Amukasa is playable. The graphics do their best to represent the original, and given the 8-bit limitations of the machine, it's honestly not too bad. The sound and music aren't very pleasant though. As far as the gameplay goes, you have one button for your weapon attack and the other provides your kick. Once you get used to everything, it plays okay. The computer AI in this one is pretty tough, or maybe I'm just too used to the other versions. Lastly, Samurai Showdown came to the Game Boy also in 1994 and also developed by Takara. Amazingly, this one has all of the characters. The graphics and sound are identical to the Neo Geo original. Wait, no, I guess they're really not. For a Game Boy game, it honestly isn't horrible. Despite being in black and white, I find the visuals fairly pleasing with plenty of detail in the backgrounds. The music is also quite good, much better than the Game Gear. The control is set up the same as the Game Gear version. Doing my special moves is pretty easy, but the timing works a bit differently. It's slower, so you have to do your moves sooner if you want them to connect. It's definitely a good portable version if you need some Samurai Showdown on the go. Overall, 
The ports of Samurai Showdown try, but none of them get it quite right. I think the Sega CD version is the most playable port when it comes down to it. It's just too bad that it's missing Earthquake and therefore not the complete game. The 3DO version would most certainly win if it were just a bit smoother. This next game is insanely popular. Well, I think well-known is probably the better descriptor. And that's really only because of classic game room. Yeah, you know what game that is. Truxton, which is also known as Tatsujin in Japan, was released to the arcades in late 1988. This is a vertical spaceship shooter developed by Toa Plan. You can pick up speed icons as well as other icons to switch out your weapons. There are also P icons. Every fifth one you collect will power up your weapon. You also have a bomb blast which honestly feels a bit underpowered. The game is immensely difficult with tons of bullets flying at you at warp speed even in the first level. When you die, you usually get powered all the way back down and set much further back into the level because of course. I like the music and the visuals though. However, there's often not a lot to see here as you're just flying over a boring space background. As a game, I don't enjoy this one much as it's just brutal. I prefer normal difficulty curves, but hey, that's just me. Truxton came to the Genesis in 1989 and it was ported to the console by Toa Plan themselves. This one measures in at 4 megs compared to the arcade which is around 10 to 12 megs. This conversion is extremely good with visuals that weren't downgraded much at all. The game is now set on the left side of the screen while your power-ups, bombs, and score all reside on the right side. This is because the arcade Truxton is a vertically oriented game and the Genesis is meant to be used horizontally. No, I'm not gonna say it. Everything is here, even the sparse backgrounds where you fly over a blue screen with a few stars here and there. Wow, look at all that detail! The sound and music is all here as well, at least I think I can't get very far in the arcade. In fact, I feel it sounds better than the arcade. It's less harsh and more pleasant to listen to. The best part about this port though is that Toa Plan completely rebalanced the game. It's actually worth spending time with now. The rules are the same and you can still get set back pretty far when you die, but it's not absolutely insane like the arcade version is. This one also has unlimited continue so it's always tempting to keep on trying. When people talk about their joy of Truxton, I imagine it's because they played this version. Or at least they played this one first. Tatsujin came to the PC Engine in 1992 and it was ported by Taito. It was only released in Japan. Like the Genesis port, this one clocks in at 4 megs. This one stretches the screen horizontally so it looks a bit weird since the aspect ratio is off. It's also every bit as difficult as the arcade version so that means it's not really worth my time playing it too much. What makes it even worse though is that there are only 5 continues. Yeah, good luck. However, I will say that the music and sound here is my favorite of any of the versions of this game. Here's a tip with this one. Turn the game on, score exactly 7100 points, and then reset the game by holding run and select. At the title screen, hold select and then press run. Shh, now you have a secret menu, don't tell. Here you can set the game to easy, give yourself more lives and bombs and all that. You can also enable a slim mode. This increases the game's horizontal resolution from 256 pixels wide to 352 pixels wide. You'll get black bars on the side of the screen, but the aspect ratio is now closer to the arcade. Unfortunately, the easy mode really doesn't help much, and this port still isn't very fun for me. If you want a huge challenge and not much to look at, you may enjoy it more than I do. Or if you really hate your life, you can set the difficulty to expart. Oh yeah, this is not a walk in the park, but honestly, I can't tell much of a difference between this and easy. But at least you can enjoy the sound test mode on that secret menu screen and listen to the excellent music.
At the end of the day, if you're going to play Truxton, the Genesis version is really the only one that's worth your time, or at least mine. Even then, there really are many, many better shooters on the console. Here's Mega Twins, which is a 1990 arcade game from Capcom. In Japan, it's known as Chicky Chicky Boys. This colorful two-player platformer has you slicing enemies with your sword and collecting coins. You can jump and cling to vertical surfaces and jump off of them to attain more height. You can even cling to ceilings, but you can't move back and forth while you're stuck there. The game also has plenty of underwater as well as flying areas. The third button is your magic bomb attack, which damages everything on screen. Between stages, someone will give you a new type of bomb attack that can now be used. With all of the coins you collect, you'd think there'd be a shot, but nope. There are lots of treasure chests during any given level that contain coins, more vitality, an extra bomb attack, a sword power-up, or some enemies. In the Japanese version, there are these giant girls to rescue for some reason, and they were removed from the international editions. Scandalous. If your vitality gets low, a constantly sounding alarm goes off which of course makes the game more fun and makes you want to spend a lot more quarters on it. This is always a great decision by the designers. The graphics are very colorful. The music is just kind of there, it's certainly not bad, but the sound effects are a bit shrill and scratchy. Still, hardly anyone ever talks about this fun game. NEC Avenue brought Chicky Chicky Boys to the PC Engine Super CD in 1994, only in Japan. Overall, this is a pretty good conversion. Almost everything is here, including the ability to play with two players simultaneously. Everything moves quite a bit slower though, and there is usually less on-screen at any given time. As a result, the game is much easier to manage. In fact, it's ridiculously easy. You might even beat it the first time you try it. You'll still have fun though. The graphics have lost any parallax scrolling and some of the visual aspects have been simplified. There's still quite a bit of color though. The tied up girls are still here since this is the Japanese release. The sound effects are largely sampled from the arcade and they sound a bit dull as a result but you get used to them. The low vitality warning sound is here but it's much less annoying. I still don't like it though. The music is of course CD quality. The tracks aren't blow your mind amazing or anything, but overall it makes for a more pleasant sound experience compared to the arcade. Chicky Chicky Boys showed up on the Genesis in 1993 and it was developed by Visco. Yeah, they called it Chicky Chicky Boys and not Mega Twins, even in North America. This is similar to the arcade in most regards, despite a minor visual downgrade. However, this version is single player only. As a result, you can choose who you want to play as at the start of the game. This one plays at the same speed as the arcade and has just as much chaos going on. The boss fights are a bit tougher than the arcade, believe it or not. You also have a very limited number of continues. What's cool about this one though is that it adds a shot between rounds for you to spend your coins. You can buy health, bombs, extra continues, and more. Now you finally have a reason to collect all of those coins. This kind of makes the other versions feel a bit unfinished in comparison if I'm being honest. The graphics aren't quite as colorful as the PC Engine, but they're still quite nice. The parallax scrolling is here of course, so overall it looks more like the arcade. They replace the tied up girls with little fairies who give you hints. One thing that's different here is that it often fades out from one scene into the next instead of just continuously scrolling like the other versions do. The music and sound are pretty good in this port. It's much easier on the ears than the arcade, and the music is almost memorable. Oh, and there's no low vitality warning sound. Thank you. This is a fantastic conversion given that it's only an 8 meg game, though you'll really have to practice to see the end. Mega Twins was also released on the Amiga and the Atari ST from US Gold in 1992. This is the Amiga version here, but it's the same on the Atari ST.
This one has the most sacrifices made to any version. The graphics try to look like the arcade, but there isn't much color on screen, and there's no parallax at all. It also plays even slower than the PC Engine Duo version. The good news, though, is that at least it has two players. You have to press up to jump, and the two buttons take care of your sword and your magic bomb attack. You do kind of get used to it, though. There's music during the title sequence, but only sound effects during the gameplay. As you can hear, it's nothing special at all. When it's all said and done, each version has made noticeable cuts from the arcade game. Out of all the versions, I prefer the Genesis due to the graphics and especially the music. I just wish that it had a few more continues or that they were cheaper to buy. Okay, we've got two more to go. Now, this next one I feel could have probably benefited from a more catchy name. Then again, maybe not. Let's check out the Astyanax from Jalico, or as I like to pronounce it, the Astyanax. This two-player game showed up in the arcades around the world between late 1989 and mid-1990. You play as a dude with an axe, maybe even a legendary axe, and you need to slice up the enemies in each level. Then, of course, you need to take care of the boss. This game only has six levels. Basically, the more full the gauge under your life meter is, the stronger your attack is if it hits an enemy. At its full strength, your axe becomes flaming. This is all similar in concept to the legendary axe on the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. But that's because the designer of Legendary Axe went over to Jellico where they let him make an arcade game with a similar concept. You can sometimes grab icons which look similar to the Legendary Axe which speed up the rate in which your gauge fills. These will also give you a magic attack which damages every enemy on screen. It's really easy to get hit in this one and it's absolutely designed to eat your quarters. In fact, most of the progress you make in the game will probably be while you're flickering due to the temporary invisibility after you take a hit. The graphics aren't bad for a 1989 game, though the audio isn't anything special. It's worth sinking a few quarters into it at least, but I wouldn't spend a ton of money on it. Actually, that's a lie, because I bought the arcade version of this for some reason, but fortunately it didn't cost too terribly much. <laughs> Astyan X came to the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990 again from Jalico. This time you're a kid who's literally named Astyan X. You're a freshman in high school and the game says you're 16 years old. I guess your dumb ass must have been held back a year or two. Anyway, a fairy princess kidnaps you, takes you to her world so that you can rescue Princess Rosebud. Quite the departure from the arcade game. So is the game itself. This game is 2 megs compared to the arcade's 28 megs. The basic principles are the same, though now it's single player only. You have a PW meter, and the more full it is, the stronger your attack. You can also sometimes collect items which look similar to the ones in the arcade, and also the ones in Legendary Axe to make your gauge fill faster. This time you're not stuck with an axe though. You can trade up to different types of swords by hacking open stone pillars. All of them seem weak, but this one is actually the weakest, though it allows you to use more magic. That's right, now you can use magic. You have an SP meter under your life meter which shows you how much you have left. SP stands for spell. You use your magic by pressing up and attack. You can switch between three different magics by pausing the game. There's the flame which shoots off in a bunch of different directions. The lightning will flash the screen and damages everything on it. Lastly, there's the orb which freezes enemies like the clock in Castlevania. You'll need to use your magic strategically as there's often enemies all over the place and they're tough to hit with your melee weapon. I just wish you could get more out of your SP meter. Sometimes if you're lucky, opening a pillar will make the fairy appear. Here, you can change your weapon or get some SP back. I highly recommend the SP. Also, be careful, because if you die, you'll get sent all the way back to the beginning of the level, even if you die during a boss fight. You do have unlimited continues, though. There are mid-bosses before the level boss who often seem to take more damage than the bosses themselves. But the most annoying thing about the game are these floating blobs that are in most of the levels. They feel like they were added as an afterthought. Like they thought the game was maybe too easy, so they added these random things floating around the levels. I don't like them. Not one bit. 
The graphics range between decent and good for the system. You even get simple cutscenes between the stages. The music is mostly average, but it's certainly not annoying. When it comes down to it, the NES game offers you more for your money than the arcade game does. However, neither of them can ever hope to touch the original legendary acts in their wildest dreams. Still, I recommend you check out the NES game. Finally, King of the Monsters 2 came to the arcades in 1992 and it runs on Neo Geo hardware. This was a much improved game over its predecessor. You choose one of three different monsters. I always choose the one that looks the most like Godzilla because why would I choose any other character in a game where you're smashing human cities? You start out fighting a few basic monsters, as well as human vehicles that are trying to bring you down. You can smash famous landmarks as you work your way through the stage. You can even pick some of them up and throw them, which is pretty damn cool. At the end of each short stage is a boss who you need to fight. This will last longer than the rest of the stage. As you play, you can pick up icons which will power you up. Be careful though, as you can also get powered back down by picking up backwards P icons. Sometimes there will even be a bomb. No matter what happens, you'll be spending a lot of quarters because dying is pretty easy to do. Oh, and I like how the Grand Canyon is not only located on the west coast, but also features Mount Rushmore. So if you ever visit the Grand Canyon, be sure to check out Mount Rushmore before you leave. This is a fun and rather unique game with great audio. The Super NES version of King of the Monsters 2 came out in North America in early 1994 and it was developed by Now Production who did Splatterhouse 2 and 3 on the Genesis. This one clocks in at 16 megs compared to the original 74 megs. For the most part, it does a pretty good job retaining the look and feel of the arcade. Although the game runs in a lower resolution, has smaller characters, has fewer frames of animation, it looks extremely faithful to the original. All of the destructible environments are here and you can still pick up parts of the landscape and use them as weapons. As far as the gameplay goes, this one seems to put more of an emphasis on wrestling style controls. This one wants you to wiggle the D-pad back and forth in quick succession quite often, and I never once saw the arcade request that I wiggle the joystick. Yeah, make up your own jokes there. I also seem to get cursed a lot in this version. If you don't know what that means, it's a status effect that usually makes your controls do the opposite of what you press. The Super Nintendo version omits this bonus stage which was in the arcade. The music and sound try, they really do, but it just can't compete with the arcade sound. Still, if you had never heard the arcade, you might think this sounds pretty good. King of the Monsters 2 also came to the Genesis in 1994, developed by B-Top. This seems to be their first title. Like the Super NES version, it was also published by Takara. The first thing you notice is that now you can choose from nine different characters instead of just three. Yeah, that's awesome. Then you get into the game and just what in the hell is this? That's right, it's a one-on-one -on -one fighter now. It still controls the same and you still sometimes have to contend with angry humans and other monsters, but seriously, what the hell? Like any fighting game, you have to win two out of three rounds in this one. You can still get a lot of the same power-ups, but there don't seem to be any power down icons to be found. You can trash the environment, but you can't pick any of it up to use as weapons. You also can't play two players versus the CPU like you can in the arcade and on the Super NES. Why did they make this change? It's 16 megs, same as the Super Nintendo version, so a lack of memory wasn't the issue. The graphics are extremely watered down in this port, especially the environments. Most of the animation seems to be here though, and the characters look fine for the console. But this game is letterboxed like a lot of Super Nintendo games. Why? Even the Super Nintendo version of this game is not letterboxed. The sound and music are okay, but again, they can't hope to match the Neo Geo. The Super NES beats this one out in the sound department, that's for sure. When it comes down to it, it's not really a poorly playing game or anything, and if you had never seen or heard of the arcade, you could do worse.
As far as the two ports of this game go, obviously the Super Nintendo version is the most faithful. I guess you could take the Genesis version for a spin if you wanted to try a different take on the game. No version of this game is objectively bad, but only one port is actually King of the Monsters 2. And there you go, a bunch of arcade games and their respective home ports. I really like making these episodes, even though for some reason this is only the third one so far. But still, playing these games back to back is super fun. So what are some arcade home ports that you'd like to see me cover in a future episode? Let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. Okay, Skitchin' for the Sega Genesis from Electronic Arts Commercial Take 1. Skitchin' for the Sega Genesis. It's bitchin'. Cut! Um, okay, let's do another take, but this time don't say the B word because that can be very scary to parents. Okay, take two. Skatin', hitchin', skitchin'. It's bitchin'. Cut! No, I said say it without the B word. Take three. Skitchin'. It's bitchin'. Cut! Can you just maybe borrow a few IQ points from a cockroach crawling around or something and get it right? Take four. Skitchin'. It wasn't designed by Gary Kitchen. Cut! Okay, that's true, but it's also very stupid, much like yourself. Try again. Take five. It's skitchin'. Get it delivered by a carrier pigeon. Cut! What in the absolute hell kind of drugs are you on, you weirdo? Take six. Be sure to check out Skitchin. It'll make your ass calipigeon. Cut. The hell does that even mean? Can't you be normal for ten seconds? Take seven. You'll worship Skitchin. Thank goodness for freedom of religion. Cut. Somebody shoot me. No, no, no. It's okay. I've got it this time. For real? Of course. Okay. Take eight. Thrash and road rash on skates. It's Skitchin. And it's bitchin'. Ah!